Hello and welcome back to the channel. So in case you didn't see the first part of this video, a few weeks ago I committed the costliest and most embarrassing mistake of my astronomical career. I had this 38 pound optical tube, it's a Mead 10 inch F4 Schmidt Newtonian on my CGE mount and I dropped it. I destroyed it. It was my fault I was using an adapter plate in a way that it shouldn't have been used. And when the scope came down, the corrector plate, ooh, it looked like that. It's a completely hopeless cause. And in fact, in the video, I declared that I wasn't even going to try to source a new corrector plate. This is a 20-year-old telescope in an obscure design. It was a hopeless situation. Well, the response from the internet was incredible. So many of you giving well-wishing and offering me words of support and offering help. I got offers from help from places as far away as Germany, including a couple of people here in the United States who have one of these telescopes and even offered to just send it to me. I said, no, 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 that, that's, that's a little too much. You don't have to do that. But there was one gentleman in Florida who said, I have a replacement corrector plate and secondary assembly for one of these telescopes. I, I guess the rest of the scope was no good. He just had this thing lying around. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll just send it to you, pay for the shipping, and you can have it. So, you know, a few days later it arrived and went over to a friend's house just to make sure everything was okay. We put it together and in less than half an hour we had it on here, we had it collimated. The collimation actually wasn't that far off from where we had it before and we're good to go. So in less than three weeks after the video came up, it's back in service. So let's take a look. The D-plate is far more secure on this mount, and at no point did I feel this rig was in any danger. And in fact, I've left this thing outside for close to a week now. We've had a really good stretch of clear weather. And in fact, neighbors have been coming by, even in the daytime, looking at this and saying, what in the world do you have here? So at least I've gotten past the psychological barrier of this thing falling down again. Now this is on my CGE mount, and if you follow this channel, you know that I've had a lot of trouble with this mount. The CGE has a reputation for being one of the least reliable large mounts ever made, and with good reason. One of the major problems it has is this runaway mount feature, where at random times it'll just start running by itself and never stops. The problem with this is you can't leave the rig unattended because at any point this could happen. Now, the last time you saw this mount was in the review of the 10-inch F4 Orion Imaging Newtonian, and I declared at the time several months ago that the mount was fixed. Well, shortly after filming that review, the mount died again. <laughs> and it went back to Scope Wizard, and he spent several months working on this. He works on lots of projects at once, but he fixed the problem once and for all. It is usually with the connectors. The connectors, it's a bad design. It uses the body of the plug and the jack as a ground and it's not secure and there are other reasons as well. So he hardwired everything into these microphone style cables. The connection is very secure and in fact, it's really beautiful work that he's done here. And so far in the week that I've been using this, it has worked just fine. Okay, how does it perform? Well, it's good. I wouldn't say it's great. I would say it's good. You see, the problem is, for example, with a Schmidt Cassegrain, by the way, many of you wrote in to say that you had dropped your Schmidt Cassegrains and some of you had gotten, for example, replacement corrector plates from Celestron, put them on and found it wasn't quite the same as it was before. And the reason for that is many times they will match the corrector plate to the primary at the factory. So when you get a different corrector plate, they're not necessarily matched and the performance can suffer. This is the case here. Now, before the accident, I actually had a chance to look through it for a few minutes. I star tested it. I looked at the edge correction and I thought this was really good optically. With the new corrector plate on here, not quite so good. The spherical aberration went up quite a bit, and I would say it is overcorrected by at least a half a wave, and I think I'm probably being pretty conservative there. And the edges are a little bit messy as well. Stars are no longer points on the, lar on the outer 10% or so of the field of view. And as you get really far towards the edge, they turn into long curved lines. 
Now you can, if you want to, adjust the position of the corrector plate. For example, you can rotate it because it's supposed to be symmetrical, but it's not. See, the problem with rotating this corrector plate is that it, the secondary rotates along with it. Now you can turn the secondary, but there is a retaining ring on the front of here, and Scope Wizard and I could not remove that retaining ring, and we weren't going to twist this thing and possibly damage the corrector plate even further, so we left it alone. Another possible solution is to rotate the primary. There are four different positions on the primary, or you can rotate the primary in the cell itself to see how it does. You know what? It's a casual, fun telescope. We didn't bother doing it. So again, how does it perform? I think it's pretty good. I mean, for the price that they sold these things for, I don't really think that we should complain. It's getting on to be early springtime now as I'm filming this, and the Virgo cluster is coming up, and I'm starting to find myself looking at galaxies in Ursa Major and in Leo, and I think I'm going to stay up one of these nights as soon as the moon goes away here and do catch that Virgo cluster. This is a really good instrument for that. It gathers a lot of light. The field of view is quite wide, and you can start to see things in the field of view. One of my favorite things to do in the spring is to see multiple galaxies in the same eyepiece view at the same time. Maybe not be visually exciting, it's more the idea of what you're seeing. You know, a galaxy is the biggest thing you can see, period, and seeing several of them in the same field of view can be quite exciting. Is there edge distortion? Yeah, but again, you know what? It's a casual, fun telescope. It's a big light bucket for wide field sweeping views, and it does that quite well. Only when looking at very big star fields like, uh, you know, the double cluster, for example, where there are stars all over the place, maybe you'll start to notice it. But again, I didn't really care. You know, one of the original ideas behind this video when I first started this project is to compare this, a 10-inch F4 Schmidt Newtonian, to that, a 10-inch F4 conventional Newtonian, with a paracord. Now, the paracord corrects for edge aberrations. According to Teleview's own literature, it takes an F4 conventional Newtonian and turns its aberrations as if it were an F8 Newtonian. That is a neat trick. They don't really do Schmidt Newtonians anymore. They just do it this way. And one advantage of this is you can move this from telescope to telescope and do your own experiments. Now, given the fact that this is not the original corrector plate and it's not really up to the factory specification, it isn't really a fair comparison, but I did it anyway. And I had these things on and off various times over the past week, and I reached some conclusions if you're interested in hearing them. Which one is better? Well, not surprisingly, the Newtonian wins. And again, it's not a fair comparison because it's not the original corrector plate. Edge distortion is actually better in the straight Newtonian than this thing the way it is right now. Put the paracore in there and things clean up really nicely. I was really impressed with how well the paracore cleaned up the image at the slight expense of a mild magnification factor. So I've had people ask me, are the tube diameters the same on the Schmidt Newtonian and on the conventional Newtonian? And the answer is no, they are not. This is slightly wider. Therefore, every time I had to swap optical tubes, I had to switch out the rings and the plates also. Keep in mind, 20 years ago, they didn't really have standardization on things like the diameters of the optical tubes. Can't really fault the Schmidt Newtonian for that. So if I had a choice today, if they were roughly the same price, which one would I buy? I think I'd go for the conventional Newtonian, even if I had to buy a paracore to go along with it, and the paracord is not a cheap device. I just think it's a cleaner way of doing things. Now saying that isn't completely fair because they usually aren't the same price. These things I find, the conventional Newtonians, hold their value pretty well in the used market. These things do not. <laughs> I've seen people almost giving away these Schmidt Newtonians, and if you really want one of these, just keep an eye out. One's eventually gonna come along at a very inexpensive price. One of the reasons they are so inexpensive is that when I find when I talk to people, so many of you went straight for the 10 inch. I mean, they made a six, an eight, and a 10. They put them on about the same mounts and you realize that LXD 75 mount, even when those things are working well, which they usually don't, is nowhere near strong enough for an optical tube of this weight. And something else I do want to emphasize again, 
as you see it here, the optical tube assembly is close to 40 pounds. And that's actually getting up to the upper limit of what this CGE can hold. And keep in mind, this at the time was a $3,300 mount. It's listed as holding 60 pounds, but I like to keep it under 30 for maximum stability. 40 pounds is starting to push it, and I notice when I'm moving things around with the hand controller that things tend to move around a little bit more than I would like. So do keep that in mind if you're in the market for one of these. And finally, do keep in mind with any fast Newtonian, the selection of the eyepiece becomes very important. The faster your optical system on a Newtonian, the better the eyepiece you need to buy. Now I do have some of these. These are these Orion Deep View. These are cheap two inch low power eyepieces. They made a 28, a 35, and I think a 42. I could keep a couple of these around for star parties. Put this in there. Yeah, not so great. I mean, the inner 50% or so of the image is clean. As you get out towards the edges, things start to get a little bit messy. Substitute the 28 millimeter deep view for this, a Teleview 27 millimeter panoptic. Things get a lot better. Keep in mind, these things were designed in a time when big daubs just started to come on the scene and Al Nagler realized they needed better eyepieces with better edge corrections. These things are said to be good for telescopes down to f4.5 and perhaps even down to f4. So what you save on buying an inexpensive optical tube, very often you lose that money back to the eyepiece that you have to buy to look through it to make the images look good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and leave this thing set up. We're in the middle of a really clear, cool, dry stretch of weather. Not too cold for this time of year in New Hampshire. I'm looking forward to having a lot of fun looking through this and searching for galaxies. You know, I think all too often we look for the faults in a telescope, and I've been guilty of this myself. You know, you see a fast Newtonian, you look at the edges and see, aha, I can see some curved stars. You see an acromat and you try to look for a false color. And I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I mean, look for what a telescope does right. I mean, this is a big light bucket, which has a wide field of view. And really most of the time, you're gonna be looking at what's in the center anyway. So I didn't really try to do a lot of astrophotography, but just for fun, I ran this up against the Orion 10 inch F4 straight Newtonian using one of these, Lunar Webcam Planetary Imager. This is my ASI 120mm. This is the Dash S variant. I've got a bunch of these. $149, you can have a lot of fun with this. You can image the moon, and if you're at a star party, you can bring out a laptop and show a bunch of people what's happening on the moon with it. So I took these two images of the moon on the same night, 12 minutes apart. That's how long it took me to swap the optical tubes off the mount using this webcam planetary imager, using the identical settings in SharpCap and processed the identical way in AutoStacker 3. No other adjustments. Put them side by side and here's what we have. Does this give us something to talk about? Well, a little bit maybe. So first of all, notice the brightnesses of the two images are pretty close to one another, and that's a testament to the Mead. It's a 20-year-old telescope with, I'm sure, some degraded coatings, and it has the corrector plate in place, but still, its brightness is pretty close to that of the straight Newtonian. Not too bad. You can see that the Newtonian is sharper and contrastier than the Schmidt Newtonian. Keep in mind, this is a corrector plate that's not original to the scope, so we can forgive some of that. Now, if I didn't have these two images side by side, would you notice anything was wrong? Probably not. I think this is fine. So, you know, the guys are saying, well, we've been making these little adjustments to this thing. What we really need to do is a complete teardown. Take the whole thing apart, clean everything, put everything together piece by piece and make adjustments as we go. You know what? I think I'm going to live with it for now. I, th I think this is fine. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, I think the original idea was to use it for a while and sell it, but I think I may keep this thing for a while, if nothing else, on behalf of everything that it's gone through. And as for this, well, you know, some of you expressed interest in having this. <laughs> you know, I don't have a problem giving this to somebody, but I, I really don't want to ship it. And I don't know if you can tell the amount of damage here is enough that I'm not sure it would survive shipping. A couple of other people suggested, why don't you just put this on and look through it anyway? And that is the kind of thing that I would do, by the way, but 
Again, the damage is so great. The secondary actually isn't on there all that securely with all these cracks, and I am concerned that the secondary could fall off and hit the primary, and it would start a whole new set of problems, so I'm not going to do that. So again, in less than three weeks, I went from a hopeless situation to back in business. And I want to thank all of you out there who offered your words of encouragement and support, all of you who offered to help, and the kind gentleman, Greg, in Florida, who sent me the new corrector plate. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.